Excellent. So, hello everybody. Um, this is the March uh, meeting of uh, the Drachma Network, and we've got three fantastic speakers. Um, so we have Professor Carl Arn Johansson. Have I pronounced that correctly, Carl? Yes, fairly fine. <laughs> Fantastic, <laughs> that's good. From the Department of Health uh, Management and Health Economics of the University of Norway. I think you're based in, in Oslo, aren't you? Yes, it's called the University of Oslo, though, but uh, that's OK. Oh, really? Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I'll make oh, the no. correction in, no the, in, the, in, in the final flyer. Sorry about that. And then we've got Dr. Uh, 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 Rosalind Parks Ritanchi, if I got, oh, no, I've murdered the end of that. No, no, I've got, a th I've got a thumbs up there. Um, who is the director uh, of the Academy of Health Innovation and uh, Uganda and Principal Research Associate uh, at cl the, cl the Clinical School, University of Cambridge. And at the end, we've got Gabriella um, from Village Reach, but she'll be turning up about halfway through the meeting um, because uh, of, of, of the time differences. I think it's about five o'clock in the morning over on the sort of uh, west coast of America. And something to, to note for all of the participants, we're going to move the meeting to a little bit in the afternoon, about three o'clock in the following meetings, um, because we want to catch more of, uh, of those folks from uh, the west coast of America. Good. So I'm now going to come off this screen now, and then I'm going to hand it over, if that's OK, to your good self, Carl. So if you want to grab the control. And I'm now going to remove myself and put myself on mute. And the floor's yours, Carl. Thank you very much. Can you see my first slide? We can see it. It looks fantastic. Excellent. Well, first, to, to all of you, many thanks for the invitation to come here. I am very inspired to meet other drone sapiens, as I call us, interested in research of drones. My background is a cardiologist for 30 years. And I've experienced extreme changes in my profession those, through those years. I didn't see 20 years ago that we today are experimenting with replacing heart valves as day treatment. That is a huge change. I also consider that drones is an exciting a new technology coming, but I'm not quite um, convinced yet uh, for what purposes it's going to work best. And that's why I'm trying to focus on today. But there are definitely one case that I very much cheer on, and that is uh, drones as a game changer for services in remote locations where roads are not existing for part of the year and things like that. Uh, delivering vaccines, medications, blood products. These are very convincing uh, use cases, which I strongly believe in. So this is a future future uh, use case, which actually is exploding as I observe it through the literature. In Oslo, I have asked the question, why drones? Is this a change for our system or is it just a cool game? I'm a, I am skeptic to those saying that this will revolutionize healthcare in modern system. I don't think so. I usually then respond, if I ask a patient, how cool do you think it is that we say one hour with drone transport if you still have to wait 90 days for your first appointment with the hospital? And we have not been discussing what can happen in the air over time, right? If many providers of drone services are going to uh, enter our airspace, that will be a challenge. I will focus on two topics. I will give you some fundamental principles that we learned through a uh, research project for three years uh, where we have looked at biological transport, transport of blood samples and some shortcomings. And I will also indicate some new business cases or new projects that I have been considering. Last week, I published a paper in drones where I focused on time savings and cost competitiveness of drone transport of blood samples compared to ground transport, current ground, ground transport, because that is a big focus in Norway, actually. And this was based on two models. One model at Oslo University Hospital, which an, I call an inner city hospital. You can see, can you see that I point on the screen? Oh? Yep, it looks, yep, I can see that perfectly. Yeah. Um, uh, and our four hospitals of Oslo University is located here in the middle of Oslo. We have four institutions. There's the National Hospital doing the most advanced uh, treatment, for example, also transplantations. 
We have a very advanced cancer hospital. We have the Ullevål University Hospital, which is the biggest unit. And we are building a new hospital at Aker University Hospital. Now this illustrates the ground distances of 5.6 kilometers, one 4.2, and the straight line Euclidean differences, uh, distances between these. Of course, straight lines for this kind of flight in Oslo is not realistic because there are many things that will restrict us for how we can fly in this area. I come back to that one. I have combined this with a district model, and this is the southern part of Norway, and this is the Inland County, which has about 400,000 inhabitants. And I have used two, we have visited many of the the district centers here. I've used two two models. It's a Dombos Medical Center, which has a Euclidean distance of 186, with three hours 40 minutes standard driving time, and another center which is called Tinset Hospital with 160 kilometers. These are pretty similar, but not equal, of course, but with one hour shorter transport. And the payload need for transport is four times higher than at Tinset and at Dumbos. I chose these three locations, Oslo, Dumbos and Tinset, to try to explore different principles and different characteristics that we have to consider. And one of my questions is, how do we assess a given amount of time in this setting? Right? If you are transporting vaccines to an island out in the sea, that, that, that's the most important to get the vaccines out there. But we are studying if drones are competitive with ground transport. And how do I assess 30 minutes for 100 samples versus 30 minutes for 10 samples and saving 10 minutes in a 15 minute route or 10 minutes in a 90 minute route? That's the principal questions we have been looking at because that's relevant for inner city and district routes. And I would then try to use scientific cost benefit analysis in parallel to what we do would be have new uh, medications or new technology for patient treatment. Then we have to deliver better treatment results for same cost or lower cost, or if the cost is going up, we have to document that the benefit is increasing more than the cost. And I will present you with one of the main conclusions we have done. You will not make a living by flying routine blood samples for our hospital. That's two short distances. So we have scrapped that. We will not consider that for our hospital as so. And one of the things that is coming in full scale now, that's point of care. We get uh, analysis. We get more equipment enabling doing blood tests and analysis bedside. We also will have such equipment in patients' home. So therefore, I predict that the volume that we are looking at today for possible drone transport, that will decrease over time. But I still strongly believe that healthcare is a very powerful market, which interests me a lot. But I usually say that the sky is not the limit, it is our head. The drones will fly, but will our minds. So I'm very interested in see how do we plan and how we, do we consider these solutions. And now I'll try to explain to you a very important perspective from the clinical, clinical angle, which is my, as a cardiologist for 30 years, that's what interests me. Consider that you have, you're, 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 you're working at one of these this, uh, medical centers in this district model from 8 to 4, 8 morning, 8 to 4 p.m., 8 hour day. The patients are coming from 8 o'clock and you take samples from these patients. And at one time there will come a car or maybe a drone to transport these to the laboratory. Assume that the car transport takes 120 minutes and the drone 60 minutes, just for simplicity. I assume that if you are planning one trip, you would do that by end of day to get all your samples transported. The sample you took eight o'clock in the morning would then have stayed eight, min eight hours in your refrigerator before it's going to transport. The last one, theoretically, zero minutes or one minute. But the average waiting time in this batch, which is going to the car or the drone, would be 240 minutes. And if the transport by car 120 and this waiting time is 240, then you will have 360 total transport time by ground. But by ground and by drone, you will have one hour shorter. But this is only 17% of the original or the current time. And I ask, are we willing to pay for that? We don't know what we will have to pay. Then you could say, well, I will increase the two trips. 
one at noon and one at end of day. Then you can see that you will half this time, but you still only get 24% gain compared to the current ground transport, but you have doubled your costs. Uh, you could also try four trips, and then you will reach 33% of relative time savings, but you will have four times as much cost per sample, right? Because you now have four trips. And this, this figure illustrates a very important the, in significance of routing frequencies. At the x-axis here, I have taken the time between routings and divided it by the ground time. So in my case, it was 120 minutes with the car. So 10% wait time on ground. That should mean that the, you have a, one routing every 12 minutes. And 100%, that will be one routing, right? So if you have 50%, that means that you have one hour routings. And I've done the same with the drone time. So if you have a drone that can fly this on 12 minutes, which is not realistic because there are not that fast drones today, but figure out that you have like, it can fly in 30 minutes instead of 60. And then you can see that the relative time gain here, percent time gain of drone versus ground are not extremely high with hourly routes and a drone time of 50% of the ground, ground time, you will have like 40% gain. Maybe that's interesting, maybe not. That depends on what you're going to transport. This is illustrating the drone speed, which is a key in the two district routings. This is minutes between flights, and this is the drone speed from 60 to 200 kilometers per hour. And here you see that if you have one transport per day at end of, oops, sorry, at end of day, you uh, with the fastest drone, you will save 26% in this routing of current ground transport. In this model, which has a longer driving time, you will save 34%. But you see that if you have drones going with, seven, uh, with 200 kilometers per hour, then you are getting some gains with fairly frequent routings. So this is very important, the drone speed and the yeah. routing frequency. Here I've just made, this is a very complex um, figure, but I'm just trying to explain what I did. I took costs and, and, and uh, we did not have exact costs from drone transport because we don't know about regulation costs and everything. I used the ground costs, which I have analyzed very detail and call that allowable costs for the drones, assuming that the drone cost per minute will be the same as car cost, right? And this, for example, shows that this is one route in the Dombos model using a 60 kilometer drone up to 200 gone. And we can see that increasing, increasing this um, uh, drone speed reduces the cost per gain, time gain and sample volume. However, if you want to use eight tours, eight trips per day, the sample volume is one eight per trip, and then you have considerably higher cost per volume and time gain. But of course, increasing the drone speed increases your time gain, reduces your cost. And then I will compare these models and have some discussion about how we should plan such district routes. You have to take into account the percent gain and the sample volume, the payload. The more trips, the lower payload, the higher, higher cost. This is data from the OS model, uh, the inner city model, where we analyze driving times every five minutes through all year, because we have some idea that that was varying very much. This is, was the, this is was the previous model where we have cars going, visiting all four hospitals in a sort of round trip. And you know that they did, if there was a delay on the second stop, that delay was carried over to the next stops. We changed that to a hub model where we had cars going back and forth between one hospital, back and forth, back and forth, and connecting with the others. And then we could reduce the current driving time considerably. But we can see that in the afternoons and in the mornings, there are some delays. What really surprised us what we thought that the winter time with the snow and icy roads the driving times would be much larger than in summer but they were not very similar we have some more extreme values but not a big change this is the most complex model we used and this illustrates the average time we can save by drones during the day and we can see that 
In the morning rush hour, we save may save up to 15 minutes, which we do not think is a significant change as the driving times are 15 to 20 minutes in the beginning. This picks the maximum time, we could say, but you can't build a business case based on these single time gains. So we had to conclude that this was not a very interesting model for this inner city model that we have made at OS, but we are looking forward more into it. This is another key. This is the last figure of, of this study. And here I have, I'm illustrating, this, these are based on data from Oslo. Now this is a drone speed from 60 to 200 kilometers per hour. Now this is a ground distance. And as you may remember from my figure, the distance in Oslo is less than 10 kilometers. And then you can see that even with the fastest drones here, you would not have a large time gain because of the short flight distance. And we also think that 200 kilometers per hour is not very interesting for the three kilometers flight path because you will use a lot of energy to get the drone up in full speed, which is, it would probably arrive before it reaches 200 kilometers. So we assume that 120 kilometers maybe would be in inner city velocity. We don't know. That, will come later on. One of the serious limitations is that we have to forget linear trajectories. We have simulated and estimated straight lines. That's not actually because that's not realistic because we have residential areas and we have order traffic, airspace control. We must remember that these are unmanned uh, drones, which would have to uh, be steered remotely. That will impact how we can fly the routes every day, which will change the time. And we have also learned a lot about wind and how that would change our path. We had the Norwegian Meteorological Institute in our research project, and they deliver flight uh, weather, uh, weather forecast for most of the air traffic in Europe. And they have made models which are very detailed. This shows that in one of, around one of the high buildings, you have a lot of turbulence and stronger wind than you think you have, which you have to consider when you are coming close to these buildings. This is the footprint of the National Hospital, and they have made models down to 15 centimeter resolution. And the brown spots here is no wind. We wanted to have a drone landing place here close to our laboratory. But this actually, this wind around this area may change very fast. And that, of course, would then change our flight path into the hospital. So these are very complicated uh, topics in a, in a city and a, uh, with, with a lot of buildings. Now I will suggest to you two, two business models. I will use five or more minutes. Is that okay, Paul? Yeah, five minutes would be fantastic. Um, I, I have uh, defined a, a W in fourth potence. Why, where, when, and what? And my major focus is what are we willing to pay for? And I suggest two models, which I've been working a little bit. That's a transport of pet isotopes and donor organs. And I read with interest the paper that you published last summer with about dangerous goods, right? And pet isotopes are definitely in this um, radioactive material class, which is hazard class seven. And you said we take out those because they have extreme requirements. And I fully understand and support that one because we have approached our regulators and they are very skeptic. But the interesting part is that this would have to be very, very robust drones, and probably of the weight of six and eight kilograms, which would be very interesting. Can we finance this in part, at least in part with this transport? Maybe. I'm illustrating the half time for the 18 fluoride isotope which is 110 minutes, and we have a cyclotron at Oslo University Hospital delivering such um, PET uh, isotopes to most of the eastern part of Norway. In Inland, which I show the model, the district model from, they have a PET bus which serves five different locations there per week. And the day it is at Lillehammer, we use 140 minutes to drive there. And if you want then five doses in Lillehammer, you have to start with 14 doses because the activity is decaying as you drive, right? And the cheapest ones, uh, the cheapest uh, isotopes would cost you 7,000 
euro for 14 doses, the most expensive 140,000 euro. If you could use a drone flying straight line as we have to use now, you could save seven doses. So I would be willing to pay you something between 3,500 and 7,000 euro if you could do this better than the car. And we are currently planning a, a new cyclotron which cost 12 million euro because it's very expensive. So that is a possible use case where we actually are very willing to pay. I have checked this. We, are, we have had a lot of dialogue with our, our, our cyclotron capacity center and that's interesting. Then it's about donor organs. I have read some papers saying that we lose kidneys because we can't use civil air traffic and get them to the destination within 24 hours. Well, I would start fixing that next week instead of waiting for drones, though. But here also is a potential for cost savings. And I'll show you how this looks in Norway because I have a close cooperation with our transportation team. We only have we have transportation in Oslo. And if we are going to harvest uh, organs in the northern part of Norway, that's a flight distance of London, Rome, approximately. And uh, you know, uh, maybe you know about something called ischemic time. How long time can we take? Can it take for me harvest the organ till we have to implant it? And for heart and lung, it's very short time. So I presented to our transportation team one year ago. Maybe you could use drones for the last mile, but that they said no, that's not interesting because they always plan the tours for harvesting organs. Uh, in the way that they return to Oslo in the afternoon, where there's no traffic on the roads. So they use 20 minutes from the airport to the hospital. Of course, this would not work in London or in New York, because I guess you have more evening traffic than we have in Oslo. But it's a very interesting perspective that how you plan influence how profitable such a service would be. We have uh, several transportation teams and the, the, those guys have to go to the hospital to harvest the organs. And when they have taken that out, then time is critical. But we actually pay 1.2 million per year just to have an airplane standing at Oslo airport ready. Uh, it is only used for this purpose. We pay 4,000 euro per hour. And if we include both uh, flight time to the destination where we harvest and the time, uh, harvesting time and transport back, that's quite some money. And now my transportation team is very interested in looking at, can we have cost savings if we could use drones to get the organs from the location where they are harvested and to Oslo? Then they could take ordinary civil airplanes and save a lot of money. So I'm now working to finance a control study of this concept with four kilometers transports. I know there are some transports, some studies with two or four kilometers. I think that's a little bit too short. So if anyone wants to join this idea, you are welcome. My last uh, uh, communication is that I'm currently trying to finalize a study where I use something called dr time driven activity based costing because that's a costing method that allocates cost to unused capacity. And I think that's very interesting for drone operators. How many hours can I use my drones for inland model or for OS model to earn money? And how many hours will the drone be grounded or not doing anything? And that's why I'm very interested in testing uh, multipurpose transport solutions, which I think is very interesting. For example, this pet drone could be used in multiple other things after the morning when they have flown these pet isotopes to the point of study. My last picture is the Wright brothers did not eliminate gravity. They learned to control the wind. We should Carl. remember that one. <laughs> Carl, that was absolutely fantastic. Um, we've got a, a little bit of time for some questions. I've got, is it you, Tam, from the Nepal Flying Labs? Would you like to ask your question? Would you like to unmute? Yeah. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Hi, yeah, we Carl. Can hear you. Hi, Carl. Thank you for an interesting presentation. Okay. Actually, we have been also doing drone for uh, medical delivery in Nepal for last one year. But in our case, we are operating in the mountains. We are operating in the rural areas. And we are using the drones to collect the sputum samples from the rural villages. 
so we we did around a uh, thousand sample delivery and often time we get questions from uh, people at the health ministry regarding the cost effectiveness and you know in our case it's not just uh, the it's not just the one factor that is the travel time uh, by car versus travel time by drone that uh, that could be considered for cost analysis so could you please um, based on your experience could you please suggest what parameters do you think this to be considered while working in a remote context uh, and also in a developing context because um, government thing it's very expensive that's my first question and second question is when we do this cost analysis often time the argument that we hear is you know if you use a car you can deliver a, a big a huge amount of weight but then if you use a drone then it's only you might need to do 1000 flight to carry a weight that is carried by one one truck at a time right so how do we deal with uh, those kind of uh, questions while we work on this kind of projects thank you Well, interesting question, and I've been um, thinking about that myself many times. <laughs> a lot of the costs that will apply to drone services, we do not know yet. You will have a continuous communication between the drone and uh, the, the monitoring system, right? Because I think that uh, the BVLOS uh, the, uh, and manned drones that can fly uh, with remote control will be will be the will be will be the case in the future. When you go to the mountains, you probably have not much drone traffic in the mountains maybe i don't know but you you um, uh, so so we do we, we do not know today how much it will cost you to use these drones i think i'm working with a big drone company and and they asked me how big will the drones be for this indal model and i said oh we can probably be under 1 kilograms per trip and they said we would like to use 5 or 10 kilogram drones because they are more stable they tolerate more wind and it it is not proportionally more expensive with the bigger drones than the smaller drones and there are also drones that are gasoline fueled which could, could could they have drones that can lift 200 kilograms so it depends on how many trips you have right if you could do all of your transport with one trip there are probably big enough drones that could fix that for you but i think this development is coming i think the but the, the the cost of these future drones is not easy to predict it will cost more to build more robust complex drones but this will be at least counteracted by the fact that technology is continuing continuously getting cheaper right so what that function will be in the future i don't know so we we have based ourselves on what how can drones compare to the current ground transports and i've mapped that into every hour of driver cost uh, extra salary for evening cost and things like that so we have very detailed cost models for the ground transport and i said if you can fix it with drones cheaper than this one start tomorrow <laughs> fantastic I, I thought the discussion was excellent but i've got an eye on the uh, the time here so perhaps can we sort of interrupt the sort of questions around Carl's presentation? And if we have some time at the end, we'll come back and then and then pick up a few of the, the, the other points. But but thank you very much, um, Carl. Um, and now I think we've got Ross. So, Carl, if you could stop sharing your screen, that would be great. And yeah, nice. good afternoon, um, everyone. Um, OK, I seem to have too many um, PowerPoints open. Hang on just a sec. <laughs> um, uh, sorry, it's been a busy day. So thanks for um, inviting me um, to talk today. Um, uh, I think if I do this there we go um can you see my presentation now yep that looks brilliant okay. and can you hear me we can okay now great. going to mute and come off so the floor's yours thanks so much um so i'm um, i'm going to briefly talk about our project um in uganda um 
which was originally um, or, or is really um, meant to be a use of multiple technologies um, to overcome geographical problems we have in delivering um, care. Um, but the first step of this project is really looking at um, unmanned uh, air vehicles for antiretroviral therapy, which is a uh, drug treatment for HIV um, and for, for medical samples. So the purpose of our project is really to undertake a research project to assess feasibility and acceptability of medical drones um, for ART delivery and um, more recently um, added on sample delivery uh, due to uh, COVID related changes in the area. And what's slightly different about our project is that we're actually trying to deliver our drugs directly to the patient, um, as well as supporting health center needs, but it's not really facility to facility transport. This is um, trying to attempt to do something different, which is patient to, oh, sorry, facility to patient uh, transport. And I'll explain why uh, shortly. So, I mean, I don't really need to tell this group this, but um, this is slides for, for, for other colleagues, but just specifically in Uganda, um, we do have parts of the country that are very expensive and, and difficult to, to travel to. For example, boat travel in um, Lake Victoria is incredibly expensive and outreach, including some nurses um, to a remote island within Lake Victoria can, you know, uh, all costs considered can, you know, cost up to $150, $200 um, to run an outreach service to a to remote island. Um, we obviously have, you know, again, as you guys know, certain medical products and diagnostics that are, should be just in time. But we also have very mobile populations. So fishermen will move where the fish are, not where their medication or where the health services are. And refugees obviously sometimes don't have a, um, a, a say in where they're going to move to at short notice. So we do have, you know, these big populations. We have a very large fishing population in Uganda, and we also have over a million refugees in the country as well. So we've chosen a couple of geographical areas, um, and I'll show you where these are on the map. But these pictures are from those areas which, you know, kind of try to show the sort of um, issues we have in, in getting uh, medical supplies um, to individuals. Um, you know, even when you manage to get the supplies on a boat, you may have to put it on a, a bicycle or walk with it into the interior of um, some of the islands because they have limited infrastructure. The islands may not have roads on the inside of them. Um, and um, up in the north of the country, what you're seeing in the top right hand picture is the River Nile. Oh, um, Ross, and, yeah, sorry. sorry. Rude. Um, your slides aren't advancing. I, I think you. Oh, yeah. Um, uh hang on okay they're advancing uh hang on let me stop a minute i'm so sorry um let me no, try. i think i think the commentary was brilliant but you are now starting to refer to specific pictures yeah, just, <laughs> so let me um okay uh when i do that um can you see the slides yep we're on slide four now OK, great. Um, yeah, so so on the left hand side is is the island population. Um, the right hand side, this top picture is the, the River Nile. And this is our team waiting to cross the Nile on a kind of flatbed ferry. Um, and, you know, and a usual picture of us trying to traverse some pretty muddy, um, nasty road uh, with our vehicle to get supplies to people. So uh, I, I'm sure this is um, completely normal for everybody on the, the call, but um, this slide is an attempt to show the kind of complexity of putting together a project like this. Um, and I won't dwell on it, but it's, um, uh, you know, shows the different pillars that, that we have split things into to be able to do the work. And really, we've got different sets, different teams leading um, these different sections from coordination and stakeholder engagement, the well, approval pro. Yes. I, is it I, still not? Yeah, is it still I, I think it's number um, five you're after now, I think. OK, it seems to be when I um, it seems to be when I go to presentation mode. So perhaps let me just keep it in. Um, keep it in uh, Edit. the mode. normal mode and then um, so can you you can see this one yep we can see number five yep. yeah okay um, uh, so really um, from our capacity at 
in in house we have um, capacity in the two pillars the the coordination and stakeholder management and approvals and governance um but we have to work with other partners for the engineering for the flying capacity um and um we are managing uh with the research oversight function so taking these different pillars and applying them to the map of where we're working i hope that moved on can you see <laughs> Yep, it's moved on. Yep. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so applying that to, to where we're working, we have two these two different projects. Um in in the West Nile, in the north of the country, uh, we are doing some COVID sample transport. And in Kalangala, which is the island districts um in Lake Victoria, we're doing um HIV medication uh, transport. So we have our drones team who are supported by our funding partners, UNCDF and, and Janssen Global Public Health. But most importantly of all the things we do, we have this very high level steering committee, which includes, I think, uh, at the current level, we have nine government ministries and agencies represented on this steering committee, plus, um, you know, other um, academic members who, who are giving us guidance. And then in different parts of the country, for, for a variety of different reasons, we have different, um, you know, capacity partners helping us um, with the engineering and, and the flying side. So just to say that we do have a slightly complicated um, research protocol, um, I won't dwell on this, but we are um, taking both quantitative and qualitative um, evaluations at a health facility level, but also um, at an individual patient level. Um, there are uh, there's a, a sub study um, for sample transport, and we're also trying to collect cost data um, uh, as well. And we hope to have results um, towards the end of you know towards September end of the year. In Kalangla, which is our island population, this is um, just an update on where we are on implementation. Um, the original red dotted lines were our original flight plans. And I'm sure for any of you guys who are doing drain projects, well, I hope <laughs> that you have the same um, the, the, the same experiences as us in that we had to change where we'd originally planned to fly and the green routes are now where we are flying to. So the essence of the project is that patients um, are attached to a, a home health centre. So in this case, it's Bufamira Health Centre in the Middle uh, Island. They are meant to get um, uh, top ups of their HIV drugs um, between once a month and once every three months, depending on what supplies are available in the ministry at the time. And um, for those of you who, who know about HIV, obviously uh, patients need to have an uninterrupted supply of drugs. If they stop taking their drugs for a month, a couple of months, um, they will have circulating virus in their blood and then they are um, at risk of passing on their HIV to, to other people. These islands have a 27% HIV positivity rate, so very, very high rates of HIV, mainly because the fishermen take drugs sometimes and then don't take drugs and then take drugs and then they don't take drugs. Um, and that is partly because they cannot access the main health center when they need to access it. And because they may move between the islands and an outreach by boat will go out to the island which they um, are, are residing on and won't find them there either they're out for the day or they're out for a month but you know they're just not available when the drugs are available to them so the way that drugs were delivered um, prior to this in these islands was um, by boat journeys and the yellow shows the boat journeys that were happening and these were monthly outreaches which as i mentioned cost about 150 to 200 dollars a, a, a run and um, healthcare workers would go out to the islands yet healthcare workers would spend almost all their time just giving out pill refills to HIV patients, which left them limited time to do blood pressure checking, um, baby checks, baby vaccinations, um, antenatal checkups, and all of the other things that they needed to do. So the idea is not to um, replace the outreaches. The outreaches would still happen because the healthcare workers still need to do their face-to-face -face care for some of the patients. But the idea is that if we can deliver the drugs um, by drone for the HIV patients, the healthcare workers won't have to spend the entirety of their outreach session um, uh, topping up people's drug supplies. 
So um, the green lines are where we ha currently have active drug refills happening. The dotted line um, here to Chitobu is a not a stable route at the moment. We're still trying to get this stabilized. We've managed a few successful runs, but it, it is not a stable route at the moment. The two um, red crosses were originally planned routes that we have had to um, cancel one of them because of just distance was not possible with the the matrix 300 that we're using and the other one was partly distance but partly sorry not sorry not distance related the other one was because um of a change in administrative areas within the ministry of health system it was an administrative issue kind of beyond our control um, so uh, across these islands, we've been running since September. Um, the top line is the number of flights that we've done um, in these uh, periods. Um, and some of these are test flights and some of these are delivery flights. Um, the second um, line is the names of the landing sites. So each island may have a couple of landing sites, which is where the boats land and currently now where the drones land. Um, and this is kind of a list of the sites that we've been flying to. Um, where it says peer support workers. So what we are doing is that we have trained, um, so HIV care often in um, resource limited settings is based upon models where one peer support worker may pick up drugs for between six to 10 other people who have disclosed their HIV status to them. So this is a model that's used all the, all the way around um, uh, Africa, where you may have one person who might travel by bike, he might travel by car, he might travel by boat to go and pick up drugs for his, his friends and family. What we have done is trained those peer support workers to be our drone delivery receivers. So they've had training on how to secure the area, how to advise people to stand back, how to, um, you know, put down a, a landing pad for the drone. And they also know how to do the documentation to give their drugs um, to um, the, the, their recipients. So um, this line um, is the number of peer support groups that we've delivered to in each of the sets of delivery. And then the bottom line is the number of patients. Interestingly, um, we were asked in January by the health facility to do an emergency top up for some people that was unplanned. So in January, there were 10 patients who got some emergency supplies from us. This is really encouraging for us because it means that the health facility is coming up with need you know, their own needs assessment and asking us to do extra top ups. And in November, what we were doing was testing, um, moving some some gonorrhea samples um, as a validation study to make sure that those samples could be um, grown, the gonorrhea could be grown after it had flown by drone and, and, and by land um, so that we could um, look at um, the the a viability of you know fresh microbiology samples um, should we want to move those in the drone in um west nile district which is up in the north of uganda um we've been running between moyo hospital and ajumani hospital um what looks like a green line in the middle is actually the nile that was on the earlier uh, photo this is a very rocky very difficult um, route that even though it's only about 35 kilometers it tends to take up to four hours to transverse because of the ferry journey and because of uh, of the the rocky route um we've tested a couple of drones in this area both the VTOL and the the multi-rotor and um, so far, we've flown 642 COVID PCR samples um, with a validation study again to check the, you know, that the sample um, test results are are good, whether they're flown in the drone or or the um, or taken by car and and by boat. So. Um, you know, we couldn't do this without our partnerships. I think I showed that in the partnership slide. Um, this is just a snapshot of all of the, the partners that we're working with, which kind of shows the complexity of getting um, this project, this kind of project up and running in our environment, which I'm sure some of the other colleagues on the call have experienced as well. Um, and um, thank you for listening. I'm sorry about the slide issues and um, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have. Ross, that was absolutely fantastic we are a little bit pushed for time and as luck would have it the next speaker has asked a cracking question so 
can we restrict the questions to one and Gabriella, would you like to reveal yourself and, and ask your question? <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. Thanks, Ross. This is great. Um, how about um for Bufa Mira? Do they have any supply issues? Or is their, their supply pretty well well in stock for, for those outreach activities? Yeah, so um that's a good question. So what we've ended up doing sometimes is, and, and I think that this is what happened in the in the January emergency supply runs, is they do sometimes have supply chain issues. And when they have supply chain issues, um, I mean, we're, we're mainly looking at ART drugs. When they have supply chain issues, we have had to do extra top up runs. So we would normally supply three months of drug in the drone. In those situations, we've had to do a month and then, you know, see how we can sort them out and wait till they get three months um, uh, uh, deliveries. The district are very, very keen that we do facility to facility supply chain work. Um, uh, we have done a baseline um, survey on this um, for to, to put our use case together. Um, and I think, um, you know, as we look to whether this is a sustainable, um, a sustainable option, I think, you know, our, our, our previous speaker was talking about what do you do when the drone has downtime? We, you know, we've been having lots of conversations this amongst ourselves and, and we are probably going to have to come up with multiple use cases for the drone, which includes facility to facility top ups, as well as facility to, to, to patient um, deliveries. Um, and we're hoping that also we can start to think about whether we can do simple diagnostic tests back to the health facility. So for example, what I'd really like to try out next is doing, sending out the drugs to the HIV patients to the drone, and then the peer support worker doing a finger prick for a dry blood spot for viral load, those being put back in the drone and coming back to the thing. So we're, we're, we're also doing kind of monitoring of their, their, their health condition, as well as delivering their drugs. That would be, you know, great. Um, we always joke about the fact that if we're not careful, the drone will be used for fish later on in the day. The fishermen are quite keen to get fish across <laughs> different islands. So we may end up with, with um, fish in the afternoon and um, medical supplies in the mornings. Um, but yeah, I think we're going to have to, to make this viable, we're going to have to think about multiple different use cases for the same um, machine. Thanks, Gabriella. That's actually a really good segue into, into my presentation because I mean I I mean I will just say like before I even start on mine, you have to like there this is one of in Village Reach's opinions one of our really big downfalls that we are not thinking strategically enough about as an ecosystem in the drone industry is that multi sectorial even beyond the health sector multi parallel supply chain is never going to work from a commercial viability perspective in low and middle income countries, at least. High income countries, maybe that's another story, but I will push everybody on this call, start thinking about that early and often uh, because it's, it really is one of our big downfalls, but that's getting into a, into a little bit of a, of a different thing, but um, thanks, thanks everybody. Um, my name is Gabriella Aylstock. Um, I'm from Village Reach um, and I'm gonna be talking today, I'm gonna do like a quick breezy presentation um, about our work in Ecuador province DRC. Um, so quick introduction to Village Reach. We are a international uh, global health organization, what offices in Malawi, Mozambique, DRC, and in the US. Um, and we, uh, one of our solutions is Drones for Health. Um, and so the, the objective of our Drones for Health program is to generate evidence on the supply chain benefits, cost, and cost effectiveness of drone technology in low and middle income countries and to accelerate the strategic introduction of drones into health systems and the evidence-based introduction of drones into health systems. Um, so we've been working in this space since 2016. And we're currently operating routine drone delivery networks um, in Malawi and in DRC, um, serving over 50 health facilities across both of the countries. And we're gonna be starting flights in Mozambique in next month. Uh, the drones just arrived in Mozambique yesterday, which is very exciting. Um, but today I'm going to be really focusing on our DRC drone network, which is our longest standing network. Um, this is a partnership um, between the Ecuador province, um, Ministry of Health, the Village Reach and Swoop Arrow to introduce drone transportation services into the hard 
to reach facilities um, in one province in DRC right now called Ecuador province. Um, and just for a little bit of context about Ecuador, it is a very large province in the northwest of the country. It's over uh, it's over 100,000 kilometers uh, squared, the entire province. Our drone network alone in the province, which is only serving a very tiny portion of it, now covers over 37,000 square kilometers. Um, just for a little context, Rwanda is 22,000 square kilometers for the entire country. So it's a huge province. We're covering huge distances. Um, our objectives of this uh, work is really fourfold. Um, we want to strengthen the enabling environment in DRC as a whole for drone use. We want to sustain routine drone delivery for immunization and other health products for a long period of time while building local capacity generate evidence on supply chain performance, cost and cost effectiveness, and establish um, some mechanisms for scale up and sustainability um, throughout the country once we do generate that evidence and if the evidence is looking promising. Um, so I'm gonna really be focusing on our evaluation strategy and very specifically our cost and cost effectiveness evaluation. Um, but this is the first robust evaluation of a two-way drone transport network that's happening over a long period of time and really a routine network. Um, so we're doing, we have three components to our evaluation. Um, the first is a supply chain performance evaluation, um, which is a process and outcomes evaluation. It's not a health impact evaluation. Um, and that's being led by the Kinshasa School of Public Health, um, UCLA and Village Reach, and with some uh, support from ID Insight, which is a very reputable consulting firm who's also doing the zipline evaluation in Ghana that's ongoing right now. Um, we also are doing a supply chain cost evaluation, which is being led by um, a consulting firm called OpsMend in Village Reach, myself at Village Reach leading, leading that consortium portion. Um, and then both of those results are going to lead into a cost effectiveness analysis. That's also being led by Opsman and Village Reach. Oh, oh sorry, I have some transitions here. Um, so uh, timeline of our evaluation, um, we completed our baseline in November and December of 2020. Um, we started flying in the, the last day of December in 2020, literally uh, the 31st. So really January 2021 is when we started flying. We've been flying um, routinely since then. Uh, we did a midline um, in this year in January and February in 2021. And then we are going to be doing our end line in June or July or of 2022. Um, so we should have hopefully results out by the end of the summer here in the Northern Hemisphere, um, which is very exciting. Um, and so the objectives of the cost and cost effectiveness evaluation, which is really my component, um, are threefold. It's really to identify the comprehensive, and I use that word very strategically, cost of introducing drones into the Ecuador immunization supply chain. Um, it's also to understand the short term cost effectiveness of drone transportation um, compared to the traditional ground transportation, um, which in Ecuador province, ground transportation is a combination of trucks, motorcycles, boats, motorized boats and non-motorized boats and walking. Um, and also to provide some insight into the value of other services that are being benefited from the drone transportation network beyond the immunization supply chain. Um, so we are also transporting laboratory samples back from the facilities. Um, we've transported PPE, other uh, HIV medications, um, TB medications, really on an as-need basis or an on-demand basis. Um, so trying to provide some a, a more of a light touch insight into that, but really the focus of our evaluation really is on the supply chain cost for the immunization supply chain. Um, so we have four foci of our um, evaluation. Um, the first is a startup cost evaluation. And this is really, oh, my slides aren't moving either. No, oh. you've stopped on like the evaluation strategy. Let me reshare. Seems like this is a Teams issue. This is weird that it's uh, happening. Makes me feel a lot better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll also leave mine um, like this. How about this? Um, can you see now? Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. On slide seven. Yeah, yeah, okay, perfect. That's where I'm on to. 
Um, so four, four parts of our, uh, of our evaluation. Um, first is a startup cost analysis. And this is really trying to capture all of the implementation costs that Village Reach is incurring um, that would not traditionally be captured in a supply chain costing evaluation. So this is things like community sensitization, stakeholder management, shipping and importation for the drones, training, um, all of those costs that are essential to introduce drones, but are, wouldn't be considered in the supply chain cost analysis. Um, for the supply chain cost analysis, we are costing the holistic supply chain. And this is really important. And I think something is one of the key takeaways of our work um, that Village Reach has honestly been doing for the last 20 years is that supply chain costs in low and middle income countries are hidden. It is not just the transportation costs that are affected in a supply chain. And if you compare drone transportation costs to drone transportation costs alone, you are never going to be cost competitive. The drones are too expensive at this stage. And I use that purposely. Let's hope that they, they drop in the future. But at this stage, just comparing ground transportation to drone transportation, you're going to have a really tough time showing anything competitive. But if you cost the holistic supply chain, which includes these other essential components of the supply chain that often get overlooked, like procurement, like storage, like the management of the supply chain, we are hoping that we might see, have a little bit better of a, of a, of a chance here to be able to show cost effectiveness. Probably not still by reducing costs. Actually, I know it's not going to be by reducing costs. We're hoping that for the cost effectiveness analysis, the, the next part, um, you know, cost effectiveness can also be shown by dramatically increasing performance. Um, so that's really where our hypothesis is right now that we may be able to show cost effectiveness. We're not sure by the significant performance increases of the, of the supply chain. Um, and then the final part is this um, non-vaccine transport service component, which is really just seeing um, how, mu how much of our, our costs are not being allocated to the immunization supply chain. So all of those drone trips that are either coming back empty or that are carrying laboratory samples or anything else like that, though the cost of those trips is not at being allocated to the immunization supply chain. So what are what are the other costs and where do we have opportunities to potentially optimize those costs for other programs um, in the Ministry of Health for other clients outside of the Ministry of Health? Um, so that, that's that component. Um, and I'll just really quickly um, tell you all the methodology that we're using for the supply chain costing. Um, it's based on the USAID deliver approach for uh, costing public health supply chains. And this is a really robust methodology that's been used in many lo low and income countries for the past 10 years, um, where you uh, collect a bottom up costing approach, activity based costing um, at all supply chain tiers. I mean, for us, we're looking at the provincial level and also in these four supply chain functions of procurement, storage, transportation, and management. Um, so I think that's, that's again, I'll just repeat, repeat, repeat. It's really important in our opinion to cost all of these different supply chain functions and not just look at the transportation costs. Um, I am at time, so let me just quickly show you um, are, are a little bit of our baseline results. Um, so we've only right now costed the traditional supply chain, um, so the land-based supply chain, um, and the total cost for those hard to reach facilities that we're reaching um, with the drone network is about $250,000 a year for the immunization supply chain. So that's kind of our, our baseline that we're working with. Um, and then I'll, I'll quickly show you a little bit of our uh, teaser data on our supply chain performance because it's really impressive right now. Um, uh, really, these are our key indicators that we're looking at. So vaccine availability in these hard to reach facilities for the last three months at baseline was 78% with the drone transportation. It's uh, actually slightly overstocked at the facility. So availability can be over 100%. Um, stockouts have reduced to zero, which is really impressive. Um, over 50% of the facilities were um, taking more than two days to receive vaccines in our, in our sample. That's now down to zero. Um, percentage of sample polio samples arriving on time has gone from 10% up to 52%. Again, it's not our primary focus of this evaluation. It's just kind of an exploratory indicator. So we aren't expecting to see our target is not 100% here. Um, and then you can see around the facilities that were um, stocked, overstocked, stocked according to plan, understocked and completely stocked out um, has improved. So um, went from 34% of facilities that were stocked according to plan to 86% of facilities now. 
Um, and then I'll just quickly run through a couple of key takeaways. Um, so from our experience, really to understand the true cost and performance and reliability of these drone transportation networks, you have to be implementing for a long time, like more than 12 months in, in our experience now, just because it takes so long to scale up, it takes a long time to get into this routine system where the health system and the drone operations team is actually functioning at capacity and functioning well in this new supply chain strategy. Um, it takes time, right? So you really, to really assess the true cost of performance, you need a long time, a long window to look at this. Um, modeling only gets you so far. Uh, we all know that drone companies are uh, are notorious for not wanting to share costs. So um, really, really implementation is where, where it's at if you wanna, wanna find these true costs. Um, and the other big takeaway is when you're thinking about a cost effectiveness analysis or any economic evaluation um, in a health system is that drones are only a supply chain solution. There are so many other variables in the health system that contribute to health outcomes that it is really hard. And this is, there is not a lot of published literature, strong published literature co connecting supply chain interventions to health outcomes. Um, so it's really hard to do a gold standard economic analysis on a supply chain intervention, measuring dailies or qualies as your unit of effectiveness. Um, you can use some proxy health outcome indicators, potentially, but still, if you're not operating for a long period of time, you know, two, three years, even that is a bit of a stretch. Um, so for us, for our, our um, cost effectiveness analysis, we're really focusing on our unit of effectiveness as being supply chain performance um, indicators and not health outcome indicators. Um, so that's just, you know, uh, a thing to note for the future. Um, and then again, I've already talked about this, when evaluating costs, it's really important to understand the holistic costs and not just focus on transportation costs. So I don't need to be the dead horse on that one. Um, so that was my super speed presentation. Um, happy to answer answer a few questions or if anyone wants to connect afterwards, I'm, I'm happy to walk you through in a little bit uh, more of a relaxed time frame. Thank you, Gabriella. That was really, really good. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry for everybody. I think we're running about I think about 10 minutes over time, but I think I think we'll all agree the three presentations have just been absolutely fantastic. Do we have any um, questions for 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 Gabriella from the group? I mean, I, I just got a comment really. I, I think I think the the, the the bit about costing business as usual is is really quite tricky, and I think it's it it's it's worldwide. Trying to look at you know blood sampling um, uh, costs in the UK, it's 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 like look, looking at you know Al Capone's <laughs> um, bookmaker. It, it's just it's taxes, it's electives, it's emergencies. It's it's yeah, it's really hard to do. So trying to get those sort of silos of counting, I think, would be really important. Um, I think um, I think Carl's um, got his hand up here. Carl, do you have a question? Yes. Well, I just have a comment. Uh, this was a very useful, very interesting uh, presentation, and I fully support you that uh, the, the the cost with drone solutions are extremely more expensive than any study have indicated. Uh, that's for sure, and, and I also support that you need long time experience. And you know, flying drones, empty drones, is bad business. So we have also been intensely, intensely discussing what other services can be combined with, and hard to reach area for for the medical system is also hard to reach for the postal systems, for example. So if we take something to the patient, they could probably take something the other way as well. So combining across sectors, that's that's the only way to to success. I think very interesting. Yeah, definitely. And I think I think one just one more comment about that, which I I've, have found really interesting and kind of just thinking that Village Reach is doing even outside of this evaluation is that, you know, there are so few drone companies operating right now and they have so few clients is that when you are hiring a drone company to transport for the health sector, they're applying all of their fixed costs to that single payer. And if we can work on increasing the market for drone services 
well beyond the health sector. We have a chance of having these companies get other clients and starting distributing those fixed costs, which are very high. There's very few variable, variable costs um, for drone services. Distributing those fixed costs across multiple clients and hopefully reducing the cost for the health system at the end. Um, but you know, we're kind of using this health system as the Trojan horse for drone delivery in so many countries. Um, and so we're kind of in this bad catch-22 around costs in that regard as well. Um, so I'm hoping that you know this is this is one way that we'll we'll be moving in the future, and that Village Reach is trying really hard to to help the drone companies that are entering these markets where we work to try to find new clients and distribute their costs so that we can lower the cost for the public health system. Mm, I think that's a really good point, isn't it? I, I don't know whether it's possible to combine in, inspection, environmental analysis. Um, I think in the UK that could work quite nicely. Um, you know, delivering medicines to distant communities, there, there's often a lot of wind power being generated. Could could the drone itself? I know it's, it, it sounds crazy, but you know, monitor something on the trip back perhaps, and that could that could offset some of the costs. Um, I think there was a comment from David. Whether David's still here? I think he he, he raised his hand in the previous lecture. Is that David uh, Gurin? Are you, are you there, David? Hi, Paul. I don't know if you can hear me. I'm sorry, I'm driving now. Yeah, terrific presentations. I just wanted to connect. Hello, Gabo. Great to see you again. Um, Roswell, I just wanted to, to connect and just mention the experiences we had at the uh, Lake Victoria Challenge for the African Drone Forum and World Bank in 2018. And, and I don't want to add any, anything to your extra presentation, just that we went through a, a whole lot of these pieces. So please reach out and discuss you know, anything that we can help you with. I was operations manager and safety manager for, for that delivery drone flying BV Lives event to Juma Island. So thanks again. Excellent presentations. I really appreciate it. Thanks for organising, Paul. Thanks, David. Thank you. David, keep driving safely, but I, I think we need to twist your arm for a little presentation. You just revealed some 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 great depth of knowledge and networking there. So so don't 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 be shocked by my by my by my request and stay on the road. But I may ask you for a presentation in the future because that sounds really exciting. There's lots of learnings I think we can then um, transfer into our own work. Brilliant. Thank you, David. Oh, thank you. Good. Um, so, as predicted, we're, we're about 10 minutes over, but I, I just want to thank all of the speakers because I think there have been some very powerful presentations. I think we're a little bit uh, further, closer to trying to square some of the sort of economics and understanding some of the costs, but I, I don't think we're quite there yet. But we've we've got some ideas about about how to attack some of these issues. Um, I just want to remind everybody to encourage um, uh, our friends on the on the on 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 the west coast. Um, we're moving the time just a little bit, so we're going to, going to be starting at three o'clock um, uh, next month on Thursday, the seventh um, of April. And we'll, we will be finishing. I've now actually put in an extra half an hour because I think I'm trying to put in too much into an hour. So we'll have an hour and a half. And we're looking at um, uh, UAV testing. How do we how do we um, test flight safety and, and uh, for, for healthcare drones and drones generally? And we have um, Alex Williamson from uh, Cranfield University. He manages their unmanned aerial systems. And so, oh, I've got a I've got a hand up here. Who is that? Is it you, Tam? Do you have a comment, you, Tam? Yes, I actually have a question. I had written it on the chat box, but then I thought it was niche. So can I ask it? Yeah, if 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 people are, uh, are prepared to just to hang on for five minutes, if that's OK. Uh -huh. Yeah, who's it directed to, you, Tam? Uh, it's true, Gabriela and, and, and other presenters. Okay. So, you know, based on my experience, based on our experience in Nepal, the government often asks for you know, in the long term, who is going to pay for um, all the medical drone related services that we are providing? Because initially it's the donor money we are using and then, you know, uh, the donor is paying the money for the project. And after the project, it has to be either paid by some of the government ministries or departments for your sustainability, right? So often time we get this question and also it is, it's, it's not just the cost of the drone and the pilot, but there are a lot of other costs as we heard in the earlier presentation. So are there any examples or instances based on Gabriela and other works where the government is actually paying for the service and not just donor after the project? Yeah, thanks, Utham, and nice, nice to speak with you. Um, it's true. 
every instance that, uh, from Milladreach's Milladreach's experience so far, the donors have been funding the market entry and the startup of these drone services. Um, And I think that's for good reason, right? Like, we don't know if these services work. We don't know if they have any effect on supply chain performance, if they have any effect on health outcomes yet. There is literally no published evidence out there anywhere on this. We do not know the cost. There is no published evidence on the cost of operating at scale. Um, So I think it's fair for the governments not to want to foot the bill quite yet for these experiments. Um, But as we are figuring this out as we're generating this evidence, as the donors are funding to generate this evidence, we are already at Village Reach working to integrate, find pathways for health financing and integrating these services into government budgets. Um, And we have had some success so far. The government of DRC, even before our results are out, they are seeing the impact that is having. They are very impressed. They are very happy. We had success in asking them to implement a line for drone funding into their Gavi health systems, uh, health strengthening services budget, which is a donor backed or donor backed government budget, literally money coming to the government from Gavi that the government is now gonna be using to uh, scale uh, the drone transportation into two additional provinces in DRC. So the government is gonna be footing the bill for that. Um, It's not going to cover all of the recurring costs. We're still gonna have to use donor funding to do that. But I think that the problem is that it's too expensive right now. Like what Carl's saying, it's not at this stage, it's not affordable for a single parallel supply chain in a country to pay for these services. So we have to figure out how to lower the costs. And then just going back to what I was saying before, where Village Reach's stance on this is, is that this needs to be expanded well beyond the health sector and these drone companies need to have other clients so that they can distribute their fixed costs and that they can then kick this back into lowering the cost for the government. So it's a bit of a long game, in our opinion, um, until we can get there. I think it's gonna take a couple of years, but I also know that certain donors are really interested in helping fund that runway to get there because they do see the potential in this transformative technology. And they also wanna make sure that the evidence is there, right? On on the supply chain performance and costs. Um, But I don't think that that should mean that you don't start working these these pathways for sustainable financing from the beginning because health financing takes time right you can't government budget cycles are notoriously hard to get into and so you have to start that from the beginning if you want to have those opportunities you can't wait until that evidence is there um so it's again it's a bit of a catch-22 but that's the pr- approach that we're, we've been taking Good. So this. Yeah. There's, thank you. Yeah, if I have one minute, I have a follow-up question. Can I ask? May I? Um, if it's quick, you type. I've just got a. I've just got an eye on the clock, actually. So, so. Yeah, I fire it off. Me. So, yeah, Gabriela mentioned about you know, uh, if we could bring in private sector as well, and not just uh, focus on the medical side of thing, but then also use the drone for other kind of delivery, then we might find some investment in the continuity of the project. But then, you know, one challenge is we spend a lot of time doing the community engagement and telling the people about the benefit of the technology. And then we operate for three months and then we disappear because the donor is not funding the second phase in many cases. So how do we manage the community expectation when you spend one year telling them about the benefit and then only implementing the project for a few months? So has there been any like private sector uh, partnerships that you know about where you know the project has been continued even after the donor support so that you also manage the community expectations. Uh, I think Zipline is the only only real winner here um, to be able to do that. And, and if I'm being perfectly honest, I, I it's a nut that I haven't been able to crack about how, exactly how um, they've been able to. Um, but I do know that the, the two countries that they've had success in doing this in are in a bit of a different financial situation than a lot of other countries. Um, they, they do have a higher GDP per capita. And so I think the government um, budgets have a little bit more flexibility. Um, and, and then in some of the places that, that I am working to, to do this. Um, so it's really tricky, Utam. I think this is like, this is the big thing that is, yeah, we're trying to figure out. And I, I don't think anyone has 
done it quite yet. Um, so, so we're working on it. Uh, we're, we're definitely wanting to share our experience. I mean, I'd love to, you know, hear from others offline if they have thoughts or ideas about this as well too. And yeah, let's connect offline as well, Utham. I think I think it's been a great discussion, you term That's fantastic, actually. Um, I think we're highlighting some of the key issues, which I, I think for some of our next round of applications and things, it's something to 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 really consider. You know, marrying up parallel services um, is there, you know, emergency observational type of thing, and then and then have some deliveries with that as well. Could be could be one answer. I don't know. Um, I, I could carry on all afternoon, but I've got, I've got other meetings to go to, and I'm sure you guys have as well. But thank you very much again to to our um, three fantastic speakers, and um, don't forget next time is going to be at um, three o'clock rather than um, uh, at half twelve, and and have a good afternoon. Thank you very much. Oh, and I must stop recording, so I can share it with you. So thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.